This is a serial podcast, an ongoing story. If you're new, don't worry about what you missed. Jump in right here, and you can always catch up later if you like. The Orbis Ethereum is an alternate reality, a metaphysical plane very different from our universe. One constant, human beings. Though humans of the Orbis differ from the ones you know. They don't breathe air. Instead, they're sustained by ether, this reality's omnipresent energy. But they do live storied lives, filled with joy, sorrow, and adventure. I'm Carlos, your storyteller, and this is Tales from the Orbis Ethereum. Season 2, Episode 8 Silence and Sentiment Rue Leclerc has a lot of money. Like, a lot of money. It's something he doesn't advertise. Virtually nobody knows his true financial worth. In the millions of credits across multiple institutions and investments on multiple worlds. It's a combination of inheritance money and consulting payments, one that affords him numerous benefits, including the ability to offer his services for free to worthwhile clients who are less than well-off. Despite the pros, Rue will trade it all to see his sister again. Agnes Leclerc, his older sister, once a noble person, now corrupted by the etherborn horror, the empowering malevolence that is Dark Etheramite. A type of Etheramite, technically, but much rarer and possessing of a corrupting influence, one that empowers its victims, but at great cost. Rue has spent the better part of a decade studying it while searching for his sister. But he's tired. He lies in bed in his posh hotel room in the Chateau Aurora, on his homeworld of Del Arctica. He's basically lived here for a couple months now. The staff doesn't complain. Rue pays and tips well. They leave him alone. Which is exactly what he wants. Rue is lost. His thoughts took a dark, sinister turn three months ago when he considered betraying his friend, Lucia Wolf, A friend who threatened to kill Rue, but who apologized sincerely. Yet, he cannot shake what he wanted to do. He needs guidance. And not just any guidance. He wants his sister's guidance, his sister's comforting presence. I don't know how much longer I can keep this up, Agnes. Rue tells the empty hotel room. Where are you? Delving into something productive, hoping it will help him put off Agnes's memory a little longer. Rue goes over an encrypted message from Parker Grace. He peruses it, impressed that the woman sought knowledge in a place even he didn't really consider. Char El Troon, Rue mouths. Face spires, three of them. One on Grand Lucian, one on Valterra, and one here. Puzzling. Three mythical spires that nobody knows even actually exist, 
and the name of some supernatural entity, Jar El Trun. But common in all the texts Parker studied. Rue gets his things and leaves the room. He wonders if his late father's laboratory can shed some light on things. Never thought I'd go back there, he thinks aloud. A lone girl, still a child, nimbly traverses the savage wilds of Grand Lucian. She leaps from treetop to branch, branch to vine, vine to outcropping, never losing her footing, never looking like the jumps are anything but guaranteed. On a high perch, a waterfall's noise and mist her only company. She scans the vast wilds. She is Daris the Silent, and she has promises to keep. In simple clothes, a tattered cloak, and carrying a large ether bow on her back, a specialized weapon that fires arrows conjured by its ethermancer wielder. Daris sees her destination. She wastes little time. Against that sheer cliff, the rocky wall towering over the wilds, is a haphazard looking but sturdy cliffside abode. It is Lucia Wolf's former home. But though the fierce swordmaster has moved on, physically and mentally, the dwelling is not abandoned. Its current occupants, sole cabinet soldiers, using the building as a base camp of sorts, under orders from their boss, prelate Magdalene Edith, to find something in the savage wilds. And ransack the place, learning everything they can about its former owner. The soldiers eat from Lucia's sizable stores, chatting about nothing in particular, thankful that Wolf left plenty of food and drink behind. Not quite as disciplined as Epsilon's squad, aka Edith's Hand, these soldiers think nothing of drinking Lucia's wine and other alcohol. Except for one soldier, a young woman who doesn't join in, a recruit looking to make a successful career for herself in service to the Soul Cabinet. This one serious soldier, this driven young woman, is the only one who doesn't mysteriously pass out at the table. She feels through the ether, knowing the soldier's sudden affliction isn't from dinner. She pinpoints the source. Darius's hand presses against the roof of that cliffside home. She uses her ethermancy, the telepathic power to affect minds to make the weak-willed soldiers within pass out. But she miscalculates. One soldier is neither inebriated nor weak-willed. More than a mere soldier, Darius knows. This one is a warrior. A warrior who swiftly climbs to the roof and points an energy rifle at Darius. No sudden moves, the warrior screams. Identify yourself! Darius, the silent, stands, slowly, but says nothing. What, can't talk? the warrior shouts. Put down the weapon! Darius exhales heavily. 
She had hoped to avoid bloodshed. Did you hear me? Put the bow down, now, the warrior demands. Darius does not. Instead, the nimble girl preps the weapon and fires several ether arrows faster than the warrior can react. Within Lucia Wolf's former home, Darius searches. Refrigerators, freezers, drawers, cabinets, shelves. Darius does not find what she's looking for. She's saddened. This is a waste of her power. And a waste of a life. Darius wonders if the passed out soldiers will mourn the loss of their warrior. Feel the loss of the best among them. The girl leaves, leaping from the building into the wilds below, letting the soldiers sleep, and leaving behind the warrior's corpse. Running through the savage wilds with graceful swiftness, Darius the Silent homes in on a very specific source. It may be another false lead, as the cliffside dwelling was. Or it may be the object of her search, one of the two critical devices she swore to find. She knows the location of one. The other, the one she's combing the wilds for, is more elusive. But perhaps it needn't be. Darius has an idea, and instead heads towards another sheer cliff. A cliff without a house built against its side, but hiding something important nonetheless. At its base, behind an inconspicuous rock, is an ancient mechanism. Darius activates it, revealing a secret door in the cliffside, one leading to a deep, dark cave. The girl leans against the wall beside the door and waits. She doesn't wait long before she hears the unearthly, quaking steps. Boom. 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 It closes in rapidly. Boom. 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 Darius realizes it is both the thing she's been looking for and the protector of this hidden shrine, its guardian. Granultim Rex! The fifty-meter-tall, spiky behemoth of a lizard with terrible strength, destructive ether beam breath, and actual localized thunderstorms roars as it reaches the cliff. It does not see the mysterious girl who has already entered. Rue stands in front of the lab ruins. Well outside any major city, touched only by the elements, it is still a source of great pain. For this is where Agnes, beautiful, heroic, strong Agnes, gave in. Gave in to the corrupting influence of dark etheramite. What am I even doing here? He asks the wind, not sure what to even look for. Some lost log under the rubble? Some obscured, hopefully still functional data pad? What did he expect to find? Before he can decide on his next course of action. Well, 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 prelate Magdalene Edith says. If it isn't Rue Leclerc himself. 
Ru turns and sees the prelate. She's in a flowing robe, not in her usual dressy business suit. Edith, Ru barks. Didn't you have your fill on Grand Lucian? Edith chuckles, approaching Rue, who backs away slowly. <laughs> I should be asking you that, the prelate returns. Valiant raiders don't come cheap. You and that swordmaster cost me a lot of money. Good. Rue spits. You hurt and killed a lot of innocent people in Port Sing. And this bothers you, Rue Leclerc. Rue's heel hits a piece of rubble, and he falls on his ass. He tries to get up, but Edith stands over him, as if daring him to try. Answer me, Rue. The prelate insists. Did it bother you that I killed innocent people in Port Sing? As Rue thinks of his answer, Edith lowers herself, laying on top of him, propping herself up on her forearms, the weight pressing against Rue's chest. He sweats, his breathing hastens, unsure he's going to live long enough to see his sister again. Only a little, he answers. And it's a truthful answer, too. Edith giggles. <laughs> see, this is why you're my favorite person, Rue Leclerc. The realization hits Rue like one of Gran Ultim Rex's thunderous footsteps. Oh, Dark Aethermite's power is wonderful, Rue, the prelate says, her voice changing into something familiar, welcoming, nostalgic. Rue lifts a trembling hand to Edith's face. Hesitating, then touching her cheek. He lingers, feeling her skin, feeling her ether. Through unsteady, quivering lips, he addresses prelate Magdalene Edith by her real name. I... I found you, Agnes. That's it for this episode. I would not need food or drink if I had your feedback. I could live off of it alone. And I want your feedback, whether you're new to the podcast or already a listener. I want to hear from you whether or not you liked it. My site is orbisetherum.com. That's O R B I S. A-E-T-H-E-R-U-M dot com. On social media, I'm at Orbisetherum on Twitter, and Orbisetherum on Google+, Facebook, and Tumblr. Holler, and I'll respond. I'm on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Play Music, and Pocket Casts, and probably 17 bajillion other services that have Index this podcast without asking. Just search for Tales from the Orbis of Therum and you'll find it. This week's shout-out is for a webcomic I've been reading for a long time. I've been reading it ever since uh, it existed on a, uh, let's say, adult-themed webcomic site. And this particular webcomic did not stop. It kept going. It has its own domain now. It has its own physical books. It is an incredibly well-written and inclusive and progressive uh, online webcomic. It is called Go Get a Rumi. And the titular character is Rumi, who uh, basically her deal is that she uh, she hops from living location from home to home in exchange for 
uh, let's say, sexual favors for the women who live in those homes. Uh, she is uh, surrounded by a cast of extremely lovable and very real people who, in Realityville, w uh, they exist in, let's call them marginalized type people, all living as a happy unit. And as the comic has progressed, uh, we're learning uh, loads and loads about the backstories of these very fascinating characters and of Rumi herself. It is a fantastic read, and my description here is not doing it justice. I've included a link to it in this episode's description. It's completely free. Go read, go get a Rumi. I recommend reading from the beginning, but honestly, um, if you check out the beginning of the current chapter or the last chapter, you'll quickly get a sense of whether or not it's for you. I strongly recommend it. Go get a Rumi. Thank you so, so much for listening. Until we meet again.